Um, I'm Doug Hesse. I direct the uh, University Writing Program, and you'll see several of my colleagues uh, out oh, like this. But if you're a writing program lecturer, just kind of raise your hand a little bit so people know. Okay. So we've kind of taken over the room, but uh, you can introduce yourselves. Um, we're really pleased today to have uh, Paul Kimatsuda uh, talking to us about some issues in um, teaching multilingual writers. Um, in one characterization of himself, Paul writes, I like having people around when I write as long as they don't talk to me. <laughs> My favorite places for writing include coffee shops and airports. I also do a lot of writing on the airplane. I also enjoy driving. I like to explore and organize my ideas on the road. That's a good thing because I'm pretty sure Paul spends a lot of time on the road these days. He's one of the country's leading experts on second language writing instruction. His research combines insights from linguistics, rhetoric, and composition studies, and we're delighted to have him at DU today. After completing his PhD at Purdue, he took positions at Miami University in Ohio, at the University of New Hampshire, where he directed the writing program. And then most recently, uh, this even caught me by surprise, he's now at Arizona State University. I first came to know of Paul's work through an important series of projects he undertook for the Conference on College Composition and Communication, which is the nation's leading organization for college writing teaching. He was founding chair of the Four Cs Committee on Second Language Writing, and has been involved with most of the recent significant efforts in this area including a masterful meta-analysis of second language writing instruction in American universities. He's edited uh, and co-edited several important books, just to name two of them, The Politics of Second Language Writing and Second Language Writing in the Composition Classroom, a critical source book. His work regularly appears in such leading journals as College Composition and Communication, College English, International Journal of Applied Linguistics, Journal of Second Language Writing, and so on. He's the series editor of Parlor Press Ser Parlor Press's series on second language writing. His research has earned him several awards, including the 2006 Richard Oman Award for the Outstanding Refereed Article Published in College English, and this is a quite prestigious award, uh, has won the uh, TOEFL Outstanding Young Scholar Award from the Educational Testing Service, and on and on. Uh, during the summer of 2007, I, I hear uh, almost immediately after you got to Arizona State, you went off to Nagoya <coughs> University in Japan uh, for a uh, stint as an international visiting researcher, the Graduate School of International Development there. Uh, but today he's in Denver, and we're delighted to hear him talk about multilingual writers in the university. Paul Kimasu. Thanks, Doug, for a wonderful introduction and for the invitation. It's great to be here. This is my second trip to Denver, and I loved it the first time, and I think I'm going to love it again, uh, being here. And since I had some technical difficulties, which is unusual, uh, I'm going to try to speed up things a little bit. Uh, but the topic today, as you know, is multilingual writers in the university, strategies for teachers. And I'm, I'm going to define multilingual uh, writers broadly and I'll ex talk more about it later on as we go along. But first, um, we don't have a lot of time to do the writing, so I'm going to just ask you to think about this. Using your second language, whatever is not your strongest language, I would like you to write about the multilingual students <laughs> in your classes, <laughs> or think about multilingual students in your classes. What are their characteristics? What strengths do they bring? What issues and concerns do they have? And what do you do to address those issues and concerns? Now, from your laughter, I can tell that uh, <laughs> this was quite a difficult uh, request. But uh, to different degrees, this is something that students are asked to do every day when they take classes in English, and if English doesn't happen to be their native language. And in US higher education, unless they are in foreign language classes, they are not even asked to write in English. It's assumed. Why consider multilingual students in our classrooms? First, because the student population in U.S. higher education today is becoming increasingly diverse, both linguistically and culturally. And because multilingual students bring rich cultural resources and linguistic resources that benefit the university and the wider community. 
and most of them are paying out-of-state tuition. <laughs> and because multilingual writers constitute a majority in the era of global academic and professional communication, just think about the instruction manuals that you receive um, with all kinds of products that you buy. There are, many of them are multilingual, most of them are now multilingual. And in business uh, today, even if your, your business is primarily located within the United States, it's really hard to avoid dealing with people who come from different language backgrounds and cultural backgrounds because multilingual speakers are all over the place in this country and also because many of the products that we buy or the parts that we use for the products come from other countries. And in some cases, we ship the material, raw material to other countries, ask people over there, wherever that might be, to put them together and send them back to us so that we can finish up the assembly, and, uh, assembly process. And of course, someone has to mediate the, communication, the complex communication process. And because addressing the needs of multilingual students can encourage <coughs> teaching excellence that benefits all students. And I'll talk more about this throughout this presentation. Now first, let's talk about multilingual writers, their characteristics and backgrounds. Now here's a l brief overview of the changing demographics in higher education. The definition of multilingual writers in U.S. higher education is becoming increasingly complex. And the ways in which second language writing specialists talk about multilingual, uh, multilingual writers nowadays is much more complex from 10 years ago. Um, there are international ESL students um, who have been associated with the traditional notion of ESL and multilingual students. And then there are resident ESL students who are not on visa, student visa, to be here, but they might be residents, permanent residents, or even naturalized or native-born citizens of this country who grew up, nonetheless, in different linguistic environment. And then there are lots of refugee ESL students who are now beginning to find their way into higher education. And many of them came to the United States not by choice, but because of political and economic circumstances that compelled them uh, to evacuate their country and then find a community in here, in this country. And there are, there have been, many speakers of non-dominant varieties of English. Think of African-American uh, vernacular speakers. And in Hawaii, there are Creole speakers. Um, and Native Americans may also speak different varieties of English within their community and outside of their community. Just looking at the uh, University of Denver may also give us some sense of how diverse uh, student population has become these days. I just looked at the website for the International Student and Scholar Services uh, at University of Denver, and here's what I found. International Student and Scholar Services serves the needs of more than 1,000 international students, faculty, staff, researchers, and their dependents at the University of Dem Denver. And in the wider community of Denver, city of Denver, 17.4% uh, of Denver residents, according to the 2000 census, U.S. Census, were born in countries other than the United States. And this is much higher than the state of Colorado. This is not uh, carbon monoxide. 8.6%. <laughs> and people who spoke languages other than English at home were uh, constitute 27% of the Denver residents and 15.0% uh, of Colorado residents overall. And there are many different factors that make second language learners and multilingual, multilingual writers distinct. But here are some of the factors that we may need to consider. The first thing that comes to mind, because I'm a writing teacher, uh, is the English, uh, written English proficiency. How well can they write in English? And this is also closely related to the spoken English proficiency. How well can they speak English? And traditionally, international students who are educated in other countries and received English instruction through written medium were able to write better than they could speak. That was at least the perception that people had. And the resident ESL students, on the other hand, learned their English through their ears, as it were, by living in English-speaking communities. 
So they might even be able to pass as a native English speaker when they are having informal conversation with their friends. But when it comes to writing, their writing may not resemble anything um, like what they can speak uh, in oral conversation situations. So teachers might be perplexed to see student papers that just doesn't seem like the student work. And in the case of international students who learn through literate medium, um, teachers might suspect that this student has been getting a lot of help, even though they might actually be able to write better because they can spend the time revising and polishing the paper, um, and so on. And we also need to consider first language literacy background. Uh, even though people may write in different languages uh, when they're in different uh, linguistic contexts, uh, studies have shown that the first language literacy <coughs> does have a lot to do with the ability to acquire and use their second language or write in second language. And what that means, again, is that international students who have been educated in literate media uh, in their countries have an advantage over some of the resident students and particularly refugee students who, whose education may have been interrupted um, and literally interrupted because they were not able to access uh, schools and textbooks uh, while, in, uh, while they were in transition and also resident students who have been here in this country and have been educated in English but have not understood what was going on in the classroom because they were given those instructions in English. But despite those challenges, students do end up in university classes uh, because they work hard and because there are many things that are important about being an intellectual, being a highly educated people in this country today than simply the ability to speak and write in a particular language. Educational background, as I said before, also plays an important role. Um, what can, and different countries have different education systems and we can't always take for granted that students would know exactly the same thing when they graduate from high school. And for that matter, we can't assume that for students who come from this country either. And students also have different attitudes and motivation toward learning a second language and toward learning in general. And I'll go into more detail about this. And also, because students come from different communities of uh, people, they might have uh, represent different rhetorical traditions, which could mean a lot of different things. Students might have different attitude toward orality versus literacy. In some rhetorical traditions, orality is highly valued, and students may not trust what they read, but they might trust stories that are told personally by people they trust in the community. Argumentative styles may be different as well. Although um, I can't find a reason to reject the, the notion that an argument consists of a claim and some kind of support. What constitutes appropriate support may differ depending on who you are talking to. When you are talking among scientists, you need a higher standard of proof than when you are talking to lay audience. And the same thing happens across different cultural and rhetorical co contexts. And by the same token, Culturally shared knowledge plays an important role in students' effort to acquire their second language. Sometimes teachers, in their attempts to make materials accessible, try to use pop culture references so that students can at least have a good time as they learn something and they can relate to the content as well and retain the knowledge better. Um, but not all students have uh, seen, for example, The Simpsons. Um, if you use that as an example, and I'm using that as an example now, uh, assuming that everybody would understand what I mean, uh, but we can't always assume that when we are working with linguistically and culturally diverse students. And we don't always know who among your students are uh, fit that profile. And students might have different attitudes toward plagiarism as well. Now, in the U.S., we have developed a particular sense of plagiarism that is strictly enforced and taught over and over. Um, and of course, not all students learn this concept or learn to practice or avoid plagiarism uh, in their writing. Uh, it's, it's a uh, lifelong learning process for native English speakers as well. But for students who come from other contexts and countries, where the notion of plagiarism is not uh, commonly talked about in educational and professional contexts. 
and where the standards of representing other sources might be different. Again, people uh, value knowledge and um, communi communication of knowledge and sources in different ways. Um, because of these differences, students may not immediately understand what we mean by plagiarism uh, based on the ways in which we explain them. Uh, and our explanations often are geared toward students who have gone through high school education in this country. So um, the presence of these students actually challenge a lot of assumptions that we have developed over the years about who the students are, what constitute good writing, uh, or good writing or good teaching for that matter. Okay. Now just to give you some idea of different populations, I'm going to contrast two typical student populations. And I'm not trying to stereotype these students because students, uh, even international students, differ among themselves um, from one another. International students tend to have explicit rather than internalized knowledge of grammar. And um, they may have had more exposure to written rather than spoken English. I'm a prime example. When I came to the United States at the age of 18, um, I didn't have a lot of access to people who were able to speak the language with me. So the primary way of learning for me in Japan was to read and write. So I was more able to read and write uh, in a variety of genres, formal and informal, than I was able to have an informal conversation. The hardest thing for me was to have a chat. <laughs> I just didn't see the point, and I just couldn't do it. I, I've learned to do it over the years, of course. And um, international students are often unfamiliar with U.S. cultural references, although, uh, because of the global gift of the media, students are more familiar with lots of different movies and cultural references. Walmart is everywhere. I saw one in Mexico, and I actually shopped there. Um, and if anybody's associated with Walmart, my apologies. Uh, little or no experience with U.S. secondary education. Uh, that's another issue. And, um, Students tend to have instrumental motivation. That is, they want to succeed. And they want to learn the language as a medium, um, a way of getting, uh, attaining certain economic and uh, educational goals. And their learning styles may vary. Joy Reid, um, a specialist in TESOL, has found that students who come from different cultural backgrounds and national backgrounds may prefer different learning styles than typical students in the U.S. Uh, some of them may be more visually oriented than uh, what we might find among uh, U.S. students. And also within the same culture she has found uh, there are gender differences. In some cultures men might be more uh, verbally oriented whereas uh, women might be more uh, visually oriented and things like that. Um, and it's hard to pinpoint which country represents certain profiles, or which student uh, represent these profiles. But it's good to know that there are differences, and these differences are much bigger than what we are used to seeing among native English speaking, monolingual, mostly monolingual American students. The resident students, the new population of students, excuse me, tend to have implicit but developing knowledge of English grammar. As I said, they might be able to speak more fluently than they can write. And they tend to have more exposure to colloquial and spoken English. Sometimes people try to make their speech easier for, to understand, or writing for that matter, uh, for students, um, international students or uh, non-native English speakers, by using colloquial expression, because it's less formal and it's supposed to be familiar. To most resident students, that strategy might work better than it would um, for international students who tend to know uh, less about different idioms that people use in this country and colloquial phrases. And because they have li lived in this country for a number of years uh, and have been exposed to um, pop culture through their years, they are more familiar with U.S. cultural references and also school culture as well because they have gone through it. And that's a major difference, uh, an advantage to them. Um, and they also have strong, tend to have strong integrative motivation. That is, one of the reasons that they want to learn English, if they do, is because they want to blend in.
they don't want to be singled out as a foreigner because they are not. And then there are the opposite uh, kind of students who might insist on speaking differently because they want to maintain their linguistic and cultural heritage and assert that identity by <coughs> speaking and writing differently. And it's hard to tell which is which sometimes, even for specialists. And again, learning styles vary greatly. Uh, for the same reason that international students' learning styles vary. As I said before, I'm not trying to stereotype, and I don't, wa I don't want you to stereotype either. Um, so I want you to think of these characterizations and profiles as descriptive, not prescriptive theory. What does that mean? So here's a concrete example. It's not okay to say, this student doesn't participate in discussion. It must be because she's an international student. That's using the knowledge that we have, the generalized knowledge that we have taken from the studies and the literature, and then applying that in hoping to explain the particular situation. This doesn't always work. And if you ask the student, is this why? They often say, no. <laughs> and sometimes because, that's because you're wrong, uh, and other times because they don't realize why they are doing what they're doing. But it's okay to say, this student doesn't participate in discussion. Maybe I should try giving everyone a chance to free write before the discussion. So use this knowledge of cultural differences as a way of giving them the benefit of the doubt, and not as a way of trying to explain and fix the problem. Okay. And the, prob uh, the solutions might actually exist in um, providing different options, lots of instructional options, and lots of options in terms of where to get uh, the kind of information that students need. If you are the kind of person who likes to um, just explain the assignment in a class without having any handouts, you might consider creating handouts uh, so that students will have access to different sources of information. Even if they can't understand your spoken language, they might be able to read it or get some help in understanding the assignment. And that will help you as a teacher in the end because the quality of assignment will probably go up as a result. Another example, it's not okay to say, this student is a resident multilingual writer, therefore, she probably doesn't know the difference between count and non-count nouns, so I'm not gonna bother with it. Well, before we make that decision, we might see what they can and can't do. Um, but it's okay, alternatively, to say, this student doesn't seem to know the difference between count and non-count nouns. That's a descriptive statement about the particular student, so it's okay. Let's find a different way of explaining. Or let's point to a section of the handbook on noun, nouns when I use these terms in my comments. So the appro more appropriate responses are solution-based. And we might need to try different strategies before we can find what's appropriate for that particular student. Okay. But keep in mind that students are also trying uh, very hard to catch up to whatever standards that you hold. So doing a little bit of extra work in terms of providing options, coming up with different suggestions, is uh, the least that we can do as teachers. And this is a little bit complicated, and I want to have lots of time for discussion, so I'm going to just skip this section. Uh, <laughs> but ba basically the idea, or I'll, I'll just go through this quickly. Basically the idea is that uh, we can't say um, use one criteria, such as international student, resident student, as a way of tell, uh, predicting what kind of profile they're going to bring. Because it's going to be a combination of a lot of different factors. Identity is a complex thing. So if we were to profile an individual ESL stu um, international student, it might look like this, aligned in one direction, but not always. Uh, we can't generalize. And if you look at an, a resident ESL student, it might look like this, okay? But again, the ways in which individuals uh, lean toward one way or the other might vary. And just for the fun of it, I created this diagram um, to show a profile of a U.S. native English-speaking student. Now, there's no alignment here. It's kind of all over the map. Now, what's interesting is that we tend to think of students and measure students by the yardsticks that we've developed based on native English speakers. Now look what happens when we do the opposite. This shows the complexity of identifying student profile. Okay. So here are some of the things to keep in mind. 
if you're going to take notes, this is the place. <laughs> the student population at the University of Denver is already multilingual. Addressing the needs of a small number of multilingual writers can be more challenging than teaching a course designed exclusively for multilingual writers. And those special courses are taught, often taught, by specialists who are trained to work with <coughs> language issues. In mixed classes, mainstream classes that include multicultural students, which is pretty much all the classes, university classes, other than special ESL classes, it's really hard to know what to do to which student, when, and how. Okay. But knowing that is a big step because sometimes we don't even think about it. And then we also need to think uh, about how multilingual writers are a diverse group of students that defy easy categorization. So these are the three things I want you to remember from the first part of this presentation. Now, so what do we do about this situation? Here are some assumptions uh, that I'm bringing to this table or the podium. Uh, first, the presence of multilingual students is unpredictable and sometimes undetectable. Okay? And I'm going to provide specific solutions or strategies uh, based on each of these points. Two, multilingual students bring rich linguistic and cultural resources as well as knowledge learned in another language. Three, reading, writing, and speaking in a second language often takes more time than it does in the native language. Four, to adult learners, the acquisition of a second language is a lifelong process. It doesn't happen in a semester, unfortunately. And number five, adjustments made for multilingual students can, not always, but often, can benefit monolingual students as well. First, be prepared, because the presence of multilingual students is unpredictable and sometimes undetectable. These maxims, by the way, sound kind of generic, but uh, what can I do? Uh, I'll try to make them more specific. First, be prepared for the presence of, or, or be prepared for the presence of multilingual students by assuming that there's always a few multilingual students in every classroom. When you think of the course that you are designing for the next semester, don't assume that most of the students are going to be, or all of the students are going to be native English speakers, and then do something about it when there is one student sitting in the back of your room that needs special attention. Be prepared to address that student. Assume that that student is going to turn up. And ref we can do, um, pre be prepared by reflecting on our own assumptions about the language backgrounds of college students. Again, who are our college students today? as opposed to the college student when we started teaching so many years ago. We can also articulate our assumptions and expectations about what to learn and how to learn. This is the most basic stuff about good teaching. The syllabus is supposed to have a list of objectives. These are the things that you will get out of this class by the end of the semester. Now, some students may need a lot more explanation than other students require because they may not know the classroom culture or what teachers value in U.S. classroom context. If, if discussion in your class is an important way of generating and negotiating knowledge in your class, make that explicit. Tell students why it's important to speak up and what kind of effects that you are hoping to see. And you don't have to spend the whole class period explaining this. You can just say one or two things here and there to remind them of the importance. And that kind of reminder can not only serve non-native speakers who are not familiar with particular classroom practices, but also mainstream native English speakers who may have been accustomed to it so much so that they don't take it seriously anymore. I do this in my first year classes, even if the students are all US high school graduate native English speakers, which was often the case in New Hampshire. They perked up. <laughs> it's the most basic stuff that they needed to be reminded of. And providing information through multiple modes of presentation, including lectures, discussion, video, handouts, PowerPoint, web CT, gestures, whatever you have at your disposal, can help students digest and understand and retain the knowledge that you are um, trying to convey. Second, be encouraging.
So what do I mean when I say multilingual students bring rich resources with them? <clears throat> and what can we do about it? We can tap into students' multilingual and multicultural uh, resources by incorporating information about other countries, languages, cultures into activities and assignments. And we can't always predict what kind of students are going to be in your classroom. And if you find a Chinese student that semester, and if you all of a sudden say, well, since we have a Chinese speaker here, why don't we read something about Chinese culture or research that comes from Chinese? That would be singling out the student. So incorporating some uh, representative uh, samples of different countries and different um, might actually uh, guard against that um, inclination. That is, act like you have always planned to do this. And we can encourage students to use, and then students might be enticed to share their own experience or what they have learned back in their countries. Because they may be reading something really interesting, cutting edge research in their language. We can encourage students to use multiple languages in planning and drafting. Sometimes it's really disheartening for teachers to see students writing or speaking in different languages because we don't know whether they are learning or whether they are just chatting or they are doing assignments for another class. Let it go. Yeah. We can't control everything. And students might often, um, well, they are often using their time productively. Um, and make it part of the class. Okay? Um, and ask them to draw diagrams as they develop their ideas. Ask them to try writing in different languages. My native English speaking students have also found it helpful and interesting. Some of the students are bored by the content because they think they know better, right? But by adding a little multilingual twist, some students say, I really enjoyed thinking about it in different language, and then come back to it and talk about it. And I do this too. I'm a multilingual speaker. I speak Japanese. And when I brainstorm in Japanese, I come up with something completely different. And sometimes I can't incorporate it because it's so different. It's not connected to what I'm trying to talk about. Uh, but it does help from time to time to know that there are resources that I can tap. And we can legitimize that by encouraging students to do so in the classroom. And we can also encourage the use of sources written in other languages. Sometimes students assume, just like they, are, they assume that they have to write in English when they are asked to write in class, they, have, they feel like they have to incorporate sources all in English. But they can actually be encouraged to go out and find sources that other students haven't really been reading, or to provide a different perspective on the issue. It can enrich learning no, regardless of the discipline. Even mathematics. Uh, in Japan, there's a lot of discussion about Indian mathematics and how that can revolutionize the traditional ways of teaching math. Number three, be patient. See, it sounds banal. <laughs> Reading, writing, and speaking in a second language often takes more time than it does in the native language. We can help students participate actively by communicating assignments and other requirements in writing, again, by providing reading materials and handouts before class rather than in class. When I was starting out as a college student, one of the most frustrating, frustrating things was that the teacher would hand out a little paragraph for us to read and discuss in three minutes. I couldn't finish that little paragraph. I needed more time. Setting aside, uh, aside some time for preparation through writing before discussion can also help. Instead of just asking them to, okay, so read this and start the discussion, we can say, okay, we're gonna st spend five minutes processing this individually. Take out a sheet of paper and jot down your thoughts your responses, or summarize this passage, and then get into groups and talk about it with your friends. Okay. Now, this strategy not only helps non-native speakers who need more time to process the information, but it can, as you probably know, also help native English speakers. And the quality of discussion is often, in my experience, so much better, because they find something that they really want to say in that discussion, rather than just doing the task because they were told to. And we can also allow the option of submitting in-class writing after class. 
Now, sometimes in assessment situation, we want to see student write, uh, authentic and impromptu student work in the context of the classroom. Okay? Um, but in other cases, um, that's for our convenience only. If we ask students or if we allow students to submit their in-class writing, type it up and email it to you, that might actually give them the little extra time that they need in order to complete the assignments more thoughtfully. Again, using my own experience, I've had so many uh, time, uh, situations in different classes where I just couldn't finish the assignment. So I came up with something really shallow and underdeveloped. And I hated myself for it. But that was all I could do given whatever time that was given to me. Be reasonable. See, it's not difficult. <laughs> For adult learners, the acquisition of a second language is a lifelong process. So be reasonable in setting goals and expectations by not assuming that students will attain native-like proficiency after a few years of ESL instruction. And setting clear objectives and goals that are relevant to the content of the course. Providing, uh, we can provide multiple examples and explain what you find effective, ineffective, and why. Okay. This is some it's hard to come up with multiple examples that are good. But if we can, we should, do, uh, we should try. Because if the students are not already familiar with a range of possibilities, repertoires, genre um, approaches, and strategies, what they might do when they see an example is to extract an essence of what they think the teacher wants and then spit it out mechanically, without even thinking. They may not learn anything in that process. But if we can pro provide different kinds of successful student writing, as an example, for example, um, they might, uh, it's, it's harder for them to process because first, they have to figure out, so these texts look different, they do different things, but they are both good, right? And that gets them to think about, so what is it, really, that makes these different pieces of uh, different approaches effective. Right? Now that's a higher kind of cognitive process that students can go through and retain uh, as part of the learning process. Our goal again is learning, oh, again. our goal is learning and not just doing the task. Um, okay. And assessing students in terms of course objectives and goals rather than on their language proficiency, it's something that seems so commonsensical but we often forget. Sometimes, um, and I, I think I've done this too, when a student is writing, uh, reporting on something, and they can't quite articulate an idea. Um, and it may have something to do with their language background. It may have something to do with their understanding of the subject. It's hard to isolate. Right? And so it's not always a clear-cut issue, but there are times when we are overwhelmed by the number of errors that we see on the page that are, we stop reading. I can't read this. I'm not going to pass. I'll try not to. Um, <laughs> you know, th this is just so frustrating because I, I just can't, right? Th that happens, even uh, among experienced writing teachers. And sometimes, and among native English speakers, we are used to thinking that this is because the student is not working hard enough, because the, this student didn't proofread enough, right? And then uh, give them a lower grade than uh, what the content of their work might deserve. With non-native English speakers, of course, this approach is problematic because they might be trying really hard, but if they don't know the structure already in their head, and if they don't know any other ways of expressing what they want to express, that's the best they can do. So again, uh, there are different solutions to different situations. So I can't give you the one solution that fits all situations. But it's good to keep in mind that we should focus on evaluating students on the basis of what we actually teach, and not on the basis of what we assume they should have learned before they came to our classes. And another point uh, under being reasonable is that a lot of times, as teachers, we feel responsible for our students because we care so much about them. We do. And when they have grammar errors, we worry that 
Well, once they graduate from this university and get a job, this student is going to suffer if this student is lucky enough to get a job. Now, that is, and sometimes, uh, for some reason, we tr translate that into thinking, okay, we need to give the student a harsher grade to let them know that they need to work on grammar. Okay. Now, the message is a good one. It's well intended. But what we are doing is uh, preemptively punishing them for the problems that they might encounter in the future. Okay. So that's something that we might keep in mind. Okay. I'm not saying that you should or you shouldn't do certain things, but that's something that we might consider as we develop our grading standards and apply those standards to different students. Okay, be accessible. Adjustments made for multilingual students can also benefit monolingual students. See that doorknob? That one, for most of us, is easy to open because we know how to use it and we have strong enough grip to do it. For students who, don't, who are physically disabled, they may not be able to open that door. When they're on a wheelchair, it's really hard to get out of this room if they are alone, without assistance. Now, by making that door uh, more accessible, by um, installing a bar that you can push to open the door, okay, we can help people who have diff uh, physical disabilities. At the same time, we might help teachers who have lots of papers in their hands and trying to get out of this room. right? So that's what I mean by helping all the students by trying to help the students who have traditionally been considered to be different. So in um, architecture, architecture, it's often called the principle of universal design. What's good for certain people is good for everybody. And we can do that, strive to, uh, for universal design by learning about the characteristics and needs of various types of students and imagining the most diverse student population as your target audience. And by communicating your assumptions, expectations, and requirements clearly and consistently, and some of these are recurring themes, of course, as you see, and exp by expanding your repertoire of teaching strategies. If you are used to lectures, try something different, group work, uh, individual take-home assignments. And as much as possible, provide background information um, for key cultural references that you make in the classroom. And sometimes we don't realize that these are cultural references that we are making because we are so used to it. So being aware of how we talk about things and what we talk about is also important. And build in some flexibility into the course plan. And when you make special adjustments for certain students, pretend that this is for everybody. Or think of ways to do, do so uh, that benefits all the students in your classroom. So here are things to keep in mind. Be prepared to teach all students. Have contingency plans. Set reasonable objectives and teach to them. Communicate assumptions, objectives, and expectations clearly. Assess students in light of the objectives. Show respect to students. Practice reflective teaching. Now you might be thinking, well, this is what we have to do for all students. That's right. Practice all the principles of excellent teaching that can benefit all students. But without falling into the trap of thinking that excellent teaching for monolingual students is synonymous with excellent teaching for all students. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I, I'm Kathy Hart. I work at the English Language Center, mm -hmm. and so our students are all international, preparing to go to DU. And um, I'm currently teaching sort of a pre-freshman English class. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess my question here would be, I have trouble with some, a lot of the times I have trouble prioritizing which comes first, which is the most serious problem. So I always think it's in terms of their ability to just communicate their ideas and organize their ideas first, and then secondly, other things, mechanics or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering how you might respond to that. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's the sort of traditional way of handling error um, in second language writing literature. And the distinction is called the difference between the global error and the local error. The global errors are the kinds of errors that affect meaning and communication, uh, leads to communication breakdown. And local errors are ones that may be annoying, uh, but are nonetheless uh, inconsequential in terms of communication. And of course, what's more important uh, in terms of the overall effectiveness of the piece of writing is to focus on the meaning uh, and focus on the global errors. And one thing to keep in mind is that global, neither global or local errors are a particular set of features that we can identify and list and treat for all students. Because depending on the situation, even within the same individual, what's global, that is, what affects meaning, what errors affect meaning, uh, changes. Okay. So um, we, we have to use intuition to some extent in order to identify them. And that's certainly effective um, because for some international students, some non-native English speakers, the number of errors are so great that we have to prioritize. We can't comment on all the errors. So that's one, one way of prioritizing. Another uh, distinction that might be helpful is to think about Recur um, errors that happen time after time. The, for example, if you see the tense error of the same kind over and over and over in the same student's writing, that's something that student hasn't quite acquired, which could mean two different things. One, the students might benefit from learning that particular structure at that moment. But it could also mean that students are, uh, that student is not ready to learn that structure yet. And to identify that, we need a uh, little more fine-tuning by looking at other aspects of student writing and by talking to the student about these particular issues in a conference situation. Um, and another kind of error is that if you see errors in certain places, but if the student is doing really well in other places in the same text, um, that probably means that the student is on the verge of acquiring that structure or the students may have already acquired that structure, but hasn't been proofreading. <laughs> um, so that changes the ways in which we approach uh, our feedback. Sure. Yes. Right. Well, one thing we can do is to tell students that in the U.S. culture, this is what we value. Um, and here are some of the restrictions, and here are some of the consequences of plagiarism. And that's a traditional ap approach that a lot of people have taken. And I find that limiting, because one of the reasons that it's limiting is the concept of plagiarism that has been uh, prominent in this country is a fairly limited conception of how people use other people's texts. Um, that is, uh, when we s talk about plagiarism, the emphasis is on who owns that idea or phrasing and giving credit to that person. And in reality, when we cite sources, we cite sources for other reasons as well. When we are in the introduction, for example, when we are setting up an issue to be explored, we might cite a source in order to demonstrate that okay, here is someone who believes in this or who argues this way and you want to argue back, you want to construct a counter argument. In that case, you are not giving credit to that person, although you are crediting that person technically, uh, but you are trying to set that person up. It's not a... <laughs> uh, but, but really that's what we are doing in order to discredit that person. Right? Um, and so telling students um, a little more about how we actually use the sources um, might be uh, revealing because that gets students to think about, so when do I cite sources and how? Uh, um, if the students don't have the larger cultural context and the literacy backgrounds that are familiar to U.S. native English speakers, then students can imagine the implications of avoid plagiarism, cite sources. If you are quoting, put them in quotation marks and mention the authors, doesn't really mean much other than, oh, I have to avoid plagiarism, okay. doing things because uh, they were told to do, right? That doesn't lead, uh, lead to larger learning about the nature of textual borrowing in academic writing. 
And one effective way of doing this is to use a familiar text, that is, your own writing. If you can show students an example of what ideas you're talking about, uh, working with, uh, your research, and show students how you're citing sources in your own discipline. Um, that can provide students with a real example, and they might get to know your inclination in the field or your topics of interest, which is always a great way of establishing teacher-student relationship. And also, because you know why th the intention of the author in citing certain sources in certain ways, you can talk about it, and you can demystify citation practices. Whereas when we are using examples from the textbook, we don't always, always know why the author cited the source in the way they did. So we can't really explain it. We can only speculate. And we are often wrong when we speculate about people's intentionality. So that's one possibility. Yes? Well, you can, um, they might not self-identify uh, in the presence of other students, uh, but they might be able to talk about their language background. And in fact, some students do that as a strategy for letting teachers know that, okay, if I'm making errors, not, that's not because I'm lazy. That's because I just simply don't have the grammar in my head. Um, so having a teacher-student conference early in the semester might be a good idea. Um, another strategy is to do an anonymous, or not anonymous, um, survey of all students. Okay. Now, I'd like to get to know you a little bit, um, and including your li literacy background, your educational background, and what, lang many, what languages you speak, and which languages you, know, you write in, things like that. And, you, and you know, other students can talk about their uh, French, or Spanish, or German, or uh, whatever languages that they have acquired. And that's one way of identifying students without singling them out. And students may, in those contexts, um, um, well, that, that's a survey context, so you will only see it, and other students won't see it. Uh, but another strategy is do what I did at the beginning of this talk. Ask everyone to write in languages other than English. Now, some students might want to talk about their uh, literacy background in other languages. Because by asking students to do that as part of the classroom assignment, you are legitimizing multilingual nature of students' linguistic backgrounds. And then again, some students don't. <laughs> but don't get upset. Yeah. Yeah. Gives, them, gives them an opportunity, but don't, um, I think you know that, right? We can't force them. Yeah. Uh, I appreciated your points about being patient and being reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I teach graduate students, and that is not. Um, and I think that there's a lot of students that Now, what was the assumption again? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. The what, what's reasonable? Uh, oh, is it reasonable to grade them on the mechanics of writing in addition to the meaning? If that's the instructional goal, and if that's what you are teaching in your class, yes. Okay. But if that's not the goal, main goal of your teaching, and if that's not uh, what you're, you can help students with, then we are in the situation of grading them on the basis of what we are not teaching. So, um, 
that's something to think about. Why don't we, um, we have Paul with us for a little bit, and we can talk informally, but we also have some wine and some other delectables up here. So uh, please uh, stick around and chat with us. Thank you, Paul.